Good evening and welcome to the third event in the Davis Museum's Virtual Artist Talk series, Handmade Photography Today. My name is Carrie Cushman and I'm the Linda Wyatt Gruber Class of 1966 Curatorial Fellow in Photography at the Davis. And today I am so pleased to welcome the artist Myra Green, who will be speaking about her work on confronting the legacy of 19th century ethnographic photography with ambrotypes. The Davis Museum at Wellesley College is located on the ancestral and unceded tribal lands of the Massachusetts people. We acknowledge the continuing presence of the Massachusetts and their relatives and neighbors, the Wampanoag and Nipmuc peoples, and pay respect to Indigenous elders past and present. To participate in today's program, please note that the event is being recorded and will be made available online in the coming days. We are using a webinar format and your microphone and video have been turned off during the presentation. Throughout the event, you can use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to enter questions and to upvote other people's questions. We will leave approximately 20 minutes for questions at the end of the presentation. The Davis Museum is grateful to the Byrne Schwartz Family Foundation for sponsoring the Handmade Photography Today series. We would also like to acknowledge our co-hosts, the Photographic Resource Center. Located at Lesley University, the Photographic Resource Center hosts exhibitions, presentations, and gatherings that support the creation and understanding of light-based media with the goal of inspiring its members, educational institutions, and the photography community with new work, ideas, and methods. For more information, visit prcboston.org. Our discussant for this evening is Dr. Nikki A. Green, Assistant Professor of Art History at Wellesley College and the Visual Arts Editor of Transition Magazine. She has written for numerous art museums, including the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Guggenheim Museum, and the Smithsonian Institution's National Portrait Gallery. Her essays have also appeared in American Studies Journal, Panorama, Journal of the Association of Historians of American Art, and the Delaware Review of Latin American Studies, among others. Her book, Grime, Glitter, and Glass, The Body and the Sonic in Contemporary Black Art is forthcoming with Duke University Press in 2021. And as recently announced, Dr. Green now serves as an advisor to the ICA Boston for the 2022 United States Pavilion, presenting the work of Simone Lee for the 59th Venice Biennale. We are so proud of you, Nikki. Congratulations. And it is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, Myra Green. Born in New York City, Green received her BFA from Washington University in St. Louis and her MFA in photography from the University of New Mexico. Green's work has been featured nationwide in exhibitions at galleries and museums, including at the New York Public Library, Duke Center for Documentary Studies, Williams College Museum of Art, Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco, and Sculpture Center in New York City. Green's work is in the permanent collection of the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago, the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and the Rose Art Museum at Brandeis. Myra is professor and chair of the Department of Art and Visual Culture and director of the photography program at Spelman College. Welcome, Myra. We are so looking forward to your presentation tonight. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Carrie. And um, I do want to start with a really extended uh, thank you to Carrie Cushman, uh, who devised this. Uh, panel, this uh, symposium on handmade photography today. Um, and unfortunately, it coincided with uh, the second week of March. Um, and I'm really impressed with how, how well she's uh, brought the spirit um, of this program into life, uh, spending time uh, to, to make sure that all of the presenters can, and can talk about their work and their impact. So thank you. And I'm really excited to uh, be in conversation with uh, 
Dr. Nikki Green, I just call her Nikki, um, because I'm interested in her research. Um, we have shared students over the years and um, I know she's a very insightful, uh, energetic and fun person. So with that, um, I, it's very strange to give this talk in front of a computer screen. Um, I'm energetic. I am um, often talk with my hands. So uh, you should keep watching the little screen on the side. What I'm first gonna do is uh, share my screen very quickly. Actually, I'm gonna make this work with me, of course. As all people in education know these days that uh, sometimes it just doesn't do what we want it to do. So give me one second. So I'm titling this talk, uh, Surface Attributes. Uh, it's a talk, um, this work, character recognition, uh, came about in 2006, 2007, but has roots that started perhaps a few years before. Uh, in 2004, I did a workshop with uh, Mark Osterman and uh, Franz Scully Osterman. And if you're deep in the weeds of photo history, you might recognize those names. At the time I was living in Rochester, New York, uh, home of the George Eastman House Museum and teaching at Rochester Institute of Technology. And it was my first teaching job and I was mesmerized by all the processes that the George Eastman House talked about and displayed in, you know, in this very small photographic museum in Rochester. Rochester is the home of Kodak. Um, it was the home of Xerox. So there was a lot of experimentation that happened throughout photographic history in Rochester, but also uh, the ability to, the, they just had a lot of cool stuff at the museum. And uh, one person who worked there was Mark Osterman who really knew processes and would give um, lectures and workshops at his home. And there was a workshop to learn how to make amber types. So I went along, I went, you know, very excited, young and energetic and uh, learned this process and I'll describe it in a moment. But what came forth was this portrait of me. I was um, asked to sit uh, in the attic underneath a skylight um, behind me. You, wouldn't, you can't see it, but was one of those 19th century clamps that hold your head still. Uh, and I sat in this position for 45 seconds as my image was made. And then you take what is a, a large piece of, a small piece of glass, five by seven inches, down into the dark room and you learn how this process is made. And as the image appears on the screen, I turn to the person next to me in the dark room, who I don't remember who it is. Um, and I just said, oh my God, I look like a slave. I look like a slave. What does this mean? And so I start um, having this ruminations about this process and how, even as I was, you know, it's 2004, I have this weird tank top on with binder clips on it. Um, all that information was removed and uh, the photography presented a new reality, a new, it, it took me out of my contemporary moment and placed me somewhere else. And I got really, really excited. And even though it's an extensive time period, you know, to make one of these, I kind of convinced Franz and Mark to let me do another one just to make sure that like the first one wasn't an aberration. So I did. And this time I sort of played it up a little bit more and I stared off into space and thought about how these pictures were made, you know, um, in the turn of the century, but still just felt this, um, this, this title of slave or, or just feeling like I was not a part of the 21st century, but about part of the 19th really stuck in my head. And I didn't really know what to do with it. I didn't know, I couldn't do the process on my own. I, you know, I had to do it in this, uh, in this studio space. And I couldn't, I didn't know what this representation meant in any way. So um, I just sort of stuck with these, I was stuck with these two things. Just to explain this a little bit more, um, excuse me, the, if you can see, there's sort of an edge here and then there's a black piece, of, black piece of paper. And so this image is actually made on a clear piece of glass. And when you back that glass, 
with a piece of black paper, the image comes into view. And so in order to make a photograph of this photograph, it's a positive process, meaning that when you make the photograph, it appears on the glass as a positive. In order to make that appear, you have to put something black underneath it. And I, and I recognize that as an interesting uh, metaphor in itself. So um, I just sort of had this with me for a while. And I, I sort of didn't know what to do with it. I said that already. So um, essentially what happened was the uh, Hurricane Katrina in 2005. August of 2005, Katrina came. Um, I was living, no, I had never lived in New Orleans, but I was an avid reader of the New York Times. And what was happening for the first time was the invention of the comment section. And we think about it today, and we know now, don't read the comments in the comment section. But um, in watching these photographs, right, because to me, that history, actually all history is intertwined with imagery. And so there are images of, of um, people surviving in attics and on their rooftops asking for, you know, begging for helicopter help. And you read the comments and they were um, probably the most disturbing thing I've ever read because it was, oh, this is the deluge. This send the niggers back to Africa. Um, they should be washed away in the storm. And I, in my head, could not understand the miscompassion of reading that image, of seeing a person on a rooftop, but then erasing sort of the tragedy and only leaving it with the racial marker, um, that these Black folks uh, deserved it for some reason and then should be wiped off the earth. And it was this moment where I realized that, that this photographic reading um, was linked to historical precedent. And so I started on a very long path. Um, it doesn't seem as long anymore, <laughs> but it took perhaps a year for me to um, really figure this out technically um, to do. And I had decided to make a series of self-portraits. Um, and that's really the parameter that I had known at this point, at this point in time. And I knew that I didn't want it on clear glass. And the first transformation I made was to black glass. Um, so black stained glass. And it took forever for me to sort of, well, I took some more workshops, let's be honest, uh, at Visual Studies Workshop in Rochester, another um, iconic photographic um, place in terms of history and standing. And I um, learned the process and tried to figure out how can I make this? I don't know how to make this. And um, experiment after experiment after experiment, I, this is actually the first image that um, recorded to glass. I think there were probably three dozen before this happened. Um, and this doesn't, I don't believe sits in the series. I think this is my own personal piece because there's something, if you look at me today, my skin does not render this dark. There's something really ominous about how the figure appears sort of pushing off the surface. And that's something that I really, really enjoy. Um, so I, I, I had to stop and think, why, why am I linking, what is the visual trigger in my head that is linking this to um, a photographic history? And while a different process, immediately the images of uh, Drana and Renti um, made by J.T. Seeley um, came to the surface. Now these are daguerreotypes, which are, um, a process based with mercury and, you know, I like living, so I'm not really trying to handle mercury these days, but um, there's something about the recording um, of the skin tone, these really hot, bright, um, bright highlights um, in, in positioning to this dark skin. Um, we also see something I'm going to talk about later, which is sort of the beginning of this mugshot um, aesthetic of to the frontal and the side view. Um, this is a part of a visual history that we sort of ingest but don't remember where it comes from. And um, these images are held um, in contention as to who owns them. Should it be, is it, is it the photographer or that history, uh, the people who, um, who 
asked to have these made, you know, or the owner, you know, the or the legacy of these um, enslaved people. And so it's a really interesting photographic history. But to me, these two images became really prominent. Um, and sort of that textual feel. I mean, people have used ambrotypes. There are many contemporary photographers who use ambrotypes, but they um, they just go, oh, I, I like that old tiny feel. But for me, there's there's a little bit more of a reference. Um, so this is the image on the card, and I, I will take this moment um, because it it does it best. I think sort of talk about some of the um, detailing of the image. Um, and I'll come out of it, I think, in this slide or the next um, to show you more. So by this time, sort of into 2006, actually, I'm going to stop my share and do it now because it'll make more sense. Um, so I'm going to stop my share for a second and just uh, hopefully come back on video. Okay, so this is just a piece of black glass and this is the size of what the image is. And so it's a three by four piece of black glass, you can't see through it. Um, and I just make reference to this to sort of talk about process for one second, that um, what you do is you hold this piece of glass and you have to, it's got to absorb photography. So first you mix collodion with ether um, and you pour it on and it's like a maple syrup and then you slowly, my thing, I'm not in practice because I'm doing it with the wrong hand, but you slowly tip this mixture around the plate so that it coats all, actually coats all the sides. I would say before that, if you can see, this is a very dirty piece of glass, but you would buff this and clean it to the ultimate of shine. First, you coat it with ether and uh, collodion, and then you set that in the dark uh, into a silver bath. And that silver bath is what makes the plate uh, sensitive to light. So this process is called wet plate collodion, meaning you make the photograph while the, the plate, the plate of glass is still wet. So then you, in the dark, take this piece of glass while it's wet and put it into your film camera, and then you make an exposure. And so therefore each piece of glass becomes a unique, um, object. So I'm going to go back into the share. And so what you see here in the upper right hand corner is my fingerprint. Like this is where I'm holding the glass as I pour the, um, the collodion ether on the image. And I could say also that the pour isn't that great or isn't the best because you start to see some marks that happen serendipitously um, because the plate's not clean enough or there's too much collodion poured onto um, the image. Let's go forward. There we go. So an image like this with all of, um, I think they're called oyster marks. Um, this is um, an image where um, the plate wasn't as cleaned as much. And then the, um, so the, Collodion didn't adhere correctly, therefore the exposure is a little bit off. And so, um, as you can see in these first two images, there's these are partial um, pictures of my face. Um, they're all self-portrait. Um, they're all self-portraits. So, I I think what's interesting in about photography, and I think the invention of any sign anything is that you should really examine like what's happening around the same time that is that thing is invented that's kind of hard that was a tongue twister but um my one of my professors at uh, university of new mexico in graduate school was uh dr jeffrey batchin and he wrote a book called burning with desire which really um you know he was writing it when i was in grad school and it, it really sort of is this interesting question as to why why were people trying to invent the idea of photography? Like, why were they trying to make a record of the real? Um, and, and I think that there's, um, there are obviously a lot of different uh, conclusions to that thesis, but um, there's a, 
there's an impetus, there's something that we don't think about today as we always use our cell phones, as we just uh, take pictures all the time, we should sometimes think about, well, why do we want to do that? Um, and you can look around as to what was going on in the time period as to um, what science was trying to do, right? Um, the, one of the, cra the crazy things, and I think it's so true as um, Batch and Talk said, um, in classes, like photography did everything it needed to do in the first 50 years and just repeats it over and over again with different technologies, whether it's black and white, color, digital, you know, it does it over and over again. But at the same time that photography was being invented, um, end of, you know, 1830s, um, you know, we have this inexact science of uh, physiognomy and phrenology, really sort of thinking about um, the shape of a head, the shape of a face, and sort of ascribing uh, sensibility, smartness, um, all of those things to it. And, and to me, that's kind of interesting because when we, uh, when phrenology and physiognomy go along with looking, right, you sort of looking and then becomes to create an instant bias. And that uh, can create a lot of issues, right? So we see with the invention of photography, physiognomy and phrenology sort of take the next route, which is the beginning of mugshots and categorization cards and even ID cards. So I always loved this um, chart, um, which is the facial expressions for the purpose of systematic identification, um, a Bertillian chart because I think there was this desire to sort of say, if you have a crook in your nose this way, um, you might steal a loaf of bread. Um, we use that today to sometimes classify religious communities or um, ethnic groups as well, is this trying to sort the, try to make, it tries to make sense of what we are looking at so that we can understand it better. It's the invention of stereotype. Um, and it doesn't always serve humankind best. I mean, you can see it here with sort of this measurement of the ear. So, um, so I take this chart and sort of break it down onto my own face, sort of going back and looking at noses, mouths, lips, profiles, eyes, and ears. And that really, this chart becomes the sort of um, organization method for my own uh, practice. Now, you would think that I would do this in a more systematic way than I did, but I didn't. I just was like, one day I'd say, I'm gonna do noses. And I would make a bunch of nose pictures and then uh, look at the chart and be like, I don't have enough eyes or the ears or things like that. So um, it became, <laughs> um, it became not as, um, organized or I can't, people are like, are there an even amount in each category? No. And it, there's somewhere on a sheet of paper or somewhere in this house is how many are in each category. I really don't know. People ask me that all the time, don't know. Um, so what's, what happens when you start photographing, especially photographing the same body over and over again, um, the body actually changes in front of itself, both because of the ways I'm controlling exposure but also just because of the natural process. And I don't think necessarily, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think you would read these as the same person, um, but that is also me. Um, to describe this process also just a little bit more technically, um, the way these are shot, um, I left visual studies workshop and then found a small dark room in the science photography labs at RIT and um, set up studio there. Um, these are shot with um, two large strobes about 14 inches away from my face. The ISO of, um, or like how film sensitive the, the actual ambrotype is, is around a two. And so the lights had to be very close to my face and a very intense strobe would go off. Um, the camera was sitting about nine inches around my face. And no, I had no assistance. Um, and all of this is done by measurement. 
So I would measure how close the camera with a with a um, tape measure or a sewing sewing measuring thing. Uh, I would measure this is how close it would be to rack focus, um, and was successful sometimes. I, sometimes I was not so successful, and you don't see those images here. Um, I want to talk about also. I just I love these ears. Um, maybe because I can't see my own ears, but I do love them. I, but there's this uh, transformative thing that if that sometimes skin looks as, as compelling as the edges of these images um, and they become, I guess this surface, the surface attributes, which is the title of the talk become really distinctive in a way. Um, I do want to mention my other um, mentor, Tom Barrow, um, who also lived in Rochester for a period of time, but was the director of the graduate program at the University of New Mexico for many years. Um, my class was the last class he uh, graduated before he retired. Uh, he's still doing well out in New Mexico. But this is a piece from his cancellation series. And again, perhaps because I'm a photographer trained, I think of a photograph not as the, the thing itself. So what Tom would do is he would take large format you know, eight by 10 pictures with, and make a beautiful negative. And then he would take in literally an ice pick to them and X them out like a printmaking plate. And it was, does two things. It reminds us the linkages between uh, the reproducibility of photography and printmaking, which are kind of odd cousins. But it also reminds us that you're actually not looking at the thing, you're looking through the thing. You're looking through a frame and in a, in an in a conceived space by the artist to see the object behind it. And I really appreciated that metaphor because I'd been making work for a while that um, sort of activated or tried to make you look through murkiness um, to, um, to question or to think about the thing behind it, specifically, again, self-portraits of my body. So I won't go on about these because there are some other things I got to talk about, which are like the titles, but, um, and how I got to the title character recognition, which is coming up shortly. But this, this idea of, of making a photo, today we think about photographs, especially ones in our phone, they are seamless. And, um, and allow us just to imagine that we can be any other place. And I really believe in sort of taking that moment and sort of thinking about the intentionality, the interaction, the direction of the image maker. And to me, there's the ability of all of these marks and, and changes help to articulate that sensibility, that, that there is a control that's happening on the image itself. So, um, so to go back to sort of character recognition um, and the title, I was, I was with, with a boyfriend at the time and to this day, I don't know what he did. Uh, I know that he did like color matching and you know, he was talking, here's the end story. He was talking about um, how satellites looked at tanks, right? And so each tank was a character, right? So if it, I don't know anything about tanks. So this big tank was a, a Q and this big tank was an, an R and that's how they would read them and then position them as to certain degrees, either North or South or East or West. And he's just sitting there and he's talking about this. I'm like, uh-huh, uh-huh. And he's like, it's so interesting because then they just do character recognition to know if, the if it was if it's the right thing in the right place pointing the right way and i just remember looking at him i was like that's lovely i need to go to my studio right now because that is exactly i think how we look at each other we sort of ascribe we look at someone and we're like are you the right person the right type of person and are you uh facing the way or doing the thing that i want right and I think that after Katrina, it was the first time that I sort of recognized that I was being looked at and judged 
and my character being recognized without my mouth being opened. Now, of course, this has happened to me before. I remember uh, seeing a director of a major space while I was filling gas, dancing in short shorts once, and that was funny, and they drove off. Um, but I do think that it's a, um, a very complicated situation as a Black woman to sort of have that on your shoulder at all times. It's to continually think that my, like I am being judged, sorted, understood by the basis of my skin. Um, and, and there are moments where I can't respond and then there are moments that I can. And so what becomes important in these pictures, um, there are two places where the body can respond back, right? The mouth um, and the eyes can really sort of have the activity of sort of uh, embracing sort of like this photograph, a mouth smiling, or um, sort, of, sort of a more medical um, examination of the mouth or being sensual or seductive. It's a place where um, there are only a few places where I can respond to the act of being looked at, the act of being judged. Um, so we have those types of responses that happen. And, and I think, I know from how I make work, I make something and then I think about it and then I know I can respond to it within the own work. So I know this like tongue thing was happening way later after I figured out how to make a more stable image like the middle one. Um, I believe this is the last slide of these, but there are a few more slides. Um, this is also uh, the eyes in which um, I have sort of that direct control to either stare directly at, confront directly this, um, this idea um, to completely shut my eyes away or to sort of swell up and well up um, in tears, which is actually happening in this photograph. Um, I think it's so crazy that there's like this, it's split um, in the middle, but I do remember like weeping as I made that last, um, made that image. So um, this work really happened through 2006 and 2007. And then in 2007, I, Left, I left Rochester and moved to Chicago and started other work um, thinking about color, race, um, looking, a project titled My White Friends. Um, but I did return to um, this process in 2017 and 18 um, as I had moved, I kept moving forward and, and, and really started to keep thinking about race and its implications in color. And I sort of opened up that idea of color a bit more to this project called Undertones, where, and I'll show you when I finish, um, where I sort of implore that same amber type process, but to different types of stained and colored glass, sometimes opaque, sometimes um, uh, transparent and translucent. And I'm, I'm just really thinking about the undertones of of black people about uh, the, the thinking about where brownness comes from um, and how to articulate that. And that work um, was on display. You can sort of see it here, the color um, of the image you can see sort of sits as a part of the shadow. And um, I really am proud of this work because it the, the images sort of are, are so unique to that glass and they really do come and go and fade um, as you walk past these shelves um, with multiple images sort of uh, lying on them. And when you see one image, perhaps another one fades away. And so um, that is my relationship to uh, amber types and the, uh, you know, the visual legacy of, of this. So I am done for a moment. <laughs> Nikki. I'm in shock. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wish for Raymond's audience so that you could get a sense of the I'm sure you would see people taking 
loads of notes and just applauding and being able to really absorb your the images as you present them because they are so uh what is the word i'm looking for they're sensual they're they're I keep doing this because you it's do want tactile. To yeah, they're tactile. Um, they're luscious, luscious. Mm. That was something. There's some. There's moisture there. I mean, you get mm. the wetness. The wetness of that plate comes through. I have so many places I want to begin, um, but what I will do and what I hinted at um, was that of, of my love for Krista Thompson's groundbreaking book, Shine, The Visual Economy of Light in African Diasporic Aesthetic Practices. And um, my students know, many people who, who know me know that I'm obsessed with shine and how it operates with as a part of Black aesthetic, fashioning, value, um, cultural and spiritual um, investments um, by Black folk. And I just wanted to start with a short quote from, from Krista Thompson's book, Shine. And she says, while modern artists working globally since the early 20th century have long emphasized the surface of their canvases or sculptures and their artistic practices, these creators who draw on African diasporic practices call attention to what might be described as the surface of the surface, the effect of light reflecting off of surfaces as the representational space for figuring Black subjects. And in that book, she goes on to talk about video light and dance hall um, and Jamaican dance hall, Jamaican Jonkanu parades. And, um, and then also she talks a little bit about Kende Wiley's surfaces. Um, in his paintings, but I appreciate about what you've explained and thank you so much for bringing the tools along with you and oh. showing us the plates because then you really get it. I mean, um, they're, they're beautiful and to know that they, they exist on their own, I, I, it would be interesting to see what you could do with the plates that you have um, wherever they may reside in Atlanta or Chicago. Um, so with that, I guess I'm, I'm, what I'm curious about is you talked a little bit about that first, that first sitting where you look at yourself and you immediately put yourself essentially in the seats of the sitters that Zeely sort of possess. One, did you feel um, as a subject to your mentor, did you have any consideration of that dynamic between the photographer and you as a sitter? Um, but then also, what is it about that sitting that provides that, that that turn for you, what exactly within that photograph sparked this, this kind of shock? Well, I think like three things. <laughs> I think first, the, first, if you haven't, we're so used to phot photography being fast and and this idea, this slowing down and sort of recognizing the fastness is a term of technology and it's not a, of it's and it says nothing to the image right the images to me are more elegant more detailed when more time is taken to sort of absorb that light but to be asked to be sitting still for 45 seconds is is, is a practice of meditation and, and for me i am a frenetic kind of you know, person. Um, so I think there's that. I think it's not a confrontation to the maker. It's a confrontation to the lens because you, you know, they can snap and walk away and you are in, in making all of these, you are just engaged with the lens. 
And in some ways that's an engagement of um, potentiality or history that is pretty intense. I don't know, I, I, I can only refer people to like others who have made self portraits because you are then in those moments completely reflective of self as to, well, what is everyone going to read? How, you know, and that, and, and one reason, I'm not answering your question really, but one reason why I never photographed other people is because I didn't want that read. I didn't want to read people that way. I was willing to accept that for myself, but not push that onto others. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't know. I think there's something about tone and re richness. There's nothing it's not sepia, it's not 1920s silver gel. It's not, it's something very specific that is um, end of sl slavery. I mean, a amber types on glass to be specific are 1850s to 1880s. And then they die, they, they don't die, but they fall off as a viable photographic means. Um, and, and film and other things are invented. It is a very specific um, time period, which is, <laughs> excuse me, tumultuous American history. I mean, you can't, you can't but link these things together in some way. Right. Or, or it would be irresponsible for me to not link these things together. Right. And so what do you think about this element of shine in the process? Because you do bring up Zeely's <coughs> portraits, right? And it's a different kind of shining where you, you talked about that light and how, how bright it is on their bodies, right? That becomes much more medical and um, mm -hmm. bright and voyeuristic. Is there something for you? Because when I looked, when I saw the, the, the slides ahead of, ahead of time, the first thing I thought was these are just gorgeous. There's a beauty to them, right? It, it, it reminds me of um, Deborah Willis's writing on beauty and posing. Although I know there's, there's something, there's something different that's happening in that, right? You're, you're, it doesn't seem to me that you're looking to pose beauty, but rather kind of create these character recognitions that you describe. Right. But what do you think of that connection between the, the surface and its shine um, as a reflection of a kind of black beauty. So it's interesting because I think that there is a, let me, I'm trying to say it like five different ways, but um, I was given advice by a, a, a well-known photographer um, about those thigh piece and that face piece that I showed that it was too dark. It's too murky. No one could get in. You need, you know, photography is about light. Bring them in with light. But also just sort of, this is not, when people look at these objects, they're, they're not thinking about classification, sorting, you know, that's not their first thing. And, and perchance, or I've learned that to bring people in with beauty, and then sort of go, this is a beautiful object that deals with very complicated metaphoric issues of historic implication. I think for me, um, in, in different bodies of work, that has always, that works the best, is to pull them in with beauty and then get them with concept, you know, like go, ah, this concept is very complicated. And people are like, oh, and then, and, and then, and then to deal with the wrestling with that, right? To have people of all sorts, of all types, to sort of wrestle with, wow, I, I'm, I am lustful. I, this object is beautiful. And I'm also thinking about how I look at people and why do I look at people that way? Hmm. And is that my own making or is that from the, uh, the institutions of visuality that are, that are the structures of visuality around me? I mean, because it's both. It is. It is true. I truly believe it is both. I'm um, sorry. Now I can go on like my high horse and <laughs> talk about visual culture. But I, I think it's really important. I don't know if everyone had goes through the whole iteration of those questions, but I hope the work gives access to those questions. 
I absolutely believe they do. And I, it's funny because the one of the quotes I pulled um, by Deb Willis was, she says she she wants the the eye to quote produce images that question history and interrogate the foundations of of beauty. It's absolutely. Well, we can we can we also take a pause as we are both like Deb Willis uh, super fans and yeah, we are. Let me show Deb, we appreciate <laughs> you if you're here or elsewhere, and everybody in the group to recognize that we are super fans. Um, no, I think that there. I think that's as a, as a working artist. I think you're always trying to find moments of access and how can you you know how do you make a photograph that no one's seen before. I mean, some people argue every photograph has been made. Well, that's not true. Um, every photograph has been conceived, but, and I, and I talk about, I do believe this, the technologies we use change the read of an image. And um, that's why this handmade um, photography, you know, like all this stuff um, gives us access to different points of history, right? Mm -hmm. if, if, if we are, um, you know, steady enough, because it's not easy. These are not easy processes. And you, you know, the funny thing is, you know, all photographers before like 1920 all died at like 45, because they're all just ingesting all the worst chemicals, you know? <laughs> you sit there making this stuff like, oh, I get it. Ah, it smells good. Wait, don't smell it too much. You're gonna get sick. Uh, but it's, 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 the technologies are important. I'm gonna ask a question that seems pretty straightforward, but who did you, once you made that, that second image that you showed us, and then you start doing that interrogation of history, right? Who were you making the images for? That's a good question. I don't, those were just like the craziest two, three years. I, you know, to, if you go further back in the catalog of Myra, it's is I was working through self portraiture for like the ten years before that, mm -hmm. so it was a natural place to. So I was photographing for myself, recognizing that the display of myself was interesting. You know, displaying myself perhaps not as I perceived myself or as others had. You know, and maybe I, in some ways I was inventing a new space for Myra or bigger space than my body had entailed or a more complicated space in all of that time. But I mean, I don't, I doubt they're on the call, but I shout outs to like Chris Morrill and Tate Shaw and, you know, Heather, like the people at Visual Studies Workshop, uh, Dan Larkin at RIT. I was, I was not, I was, I was a lone black woman just making work. My, my friends and support systems uh, were not black. And, um, but at the same time, we're happily engaged in that conversation of thinking about um, what it meant or how this worked or if they worked at all, or were you just making pretty things? And, you know, there was like three years that people, I mean, it's so funny to me. I, I'm so excited that they exist in museums. I used to carry those on planes and little boxes and just, you know, like, oh, look at this. <laughs> I mean, because that's what you do. You know, you're just, you're not like, oh, I'm making big arts. You're like, I'm making this thing. It's kind of cool. You want to see it? Okay, here it is. Okay, I got to go home and take it with me. Um, so I think I was making it for my, that was the question, right? Who are you making it for? I think, it for? Yeah. I think myself, in a way, in a way probably to answer or accept. I don't think I still accept it that people, you know, judge me in ways I can't control. Um, but I'm also now like a bit older and I don't, I'm like, I don't give. <laughs> you can finish that sentence. <laughs> That's right. I've also been, you know, the more and more I study art specifically by artists of African descent um, and certainly artists who have, who were born in the United States, um, especially, I've, um, I've been calling on uh, our ancestor, Toni Morrison, quite a bit 
<laughs> pretty much every talk I've given this fall, I, I try to bring in a Tony, Tony Morrison quote. Um, and I, I like to refer to one of her interviews with uh, Charlie Rose. There were many of them, mm -hmm. but there was one in particular in 1998. And it's, she's sort of confronting a recurring theme of her writing um, that she didn't write enough about white people. And um, she recalled one response of her shortcomings after the publication of her little second novel called Sula. And she said to him, one day she, meaning me, and if you know Toni Morrison's actions, like, meaning me, <laughs> like me, Toni Morrison, <laughs> will have to face up to real responsibilities and get mature and write about the real confrontation for black people, which is white people. As though our lives have no meaning and no depth without the white gaze. And I have spent my entire writing life trying to make sure that the white gaze was not the dominant one in any of my books. And I really do feel like that is, it comes through. I wanted you to say what you were gonna say before I realized, yeah, you're just doing it for yourself. And, but with that said, I, it's funny because I do remember you oh, sending me. Oh boy, there it is. Sense. You can't see the white in the title, but you can't. Well, well, it's purposeful. It like disappears in its own. Uh -huh. aura. Uh. I mean, I, you know, it's, you know, they're, yeah. they're nice. They're great. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different conceptual paradigm. Do you want me to talk about it very quickly? Well, I guess I, it's such a striking difference. Yeah. And yeah. I, since you mentioned my white friends, yeah. you, like you, you referred to it very quickly. Could you? I will, I guess I will say I know there's one of my white friends on this call because my white friends. She's in. She's in the chat. Ask questions. <laughs> uh, hi, Maura. Um, it's a, okay. So. What happened, I'll tell the history, it's like a lot of things aligned and a bunch of different questions happen. Right. I was leaving Rochester, I was leaving the labs and had an open conversation with a good friend who was like, these are beautiful objects, mm -hmm. um, but I can't engage in that blackness question. Oh. Right, I, honest. And I said, okay, but I go, but don't you think about race all the time? Like, isn't it just a constant thing that is a part of your everyday existence? He's like, nah. Nothing. I was like, but don't, don't white people, don't, uh. now granted, I will give you, it was 2007. It was not now. So we, are, we live in different times and we're in different realities then and now. I think the percentage of people who think about what whiteness means and what whiteness, whiteness and then therefore you go through the same conceptual path. How is whiteness conceived and portrayed in a photograph and create a neutral sense of sort of banality is the point of the book. So there's, there, you're like, these are nice. I was like, yeah, that's the point of the book is that, is that can you trigger that same type of conceptual, you know, un, unwrapping unpeeling on a contemporary modern process of color photography and a white image? Or is, are you just immediately implicit and accepted of its portraiture and everything it means? And so they are, to me, the people are like, these are so far apart. I'm like, they are literally lockstep. They are literally doing the same thing with using two different technologies to explore the same type of uh, photographic visual, like how visual culture helps us create and maintain stereotypes. It's, they're the same thing. And they just, sorry, Nikki, so <laughs> they, they, that's how that works. And, you know, I actually, you mentioned trigger again. I, I, I bolded it in my notes, that th this idea of a visual trigger of photographic history, that mindfulness that you're saying, we're, we are not even paying attention no. to why we're taking the images that we're taking. What are we trying to capture? Why are we walking? I literally have access to 17,000 images <laughs> from my phone. I 
and I have many, many more, right? That idea of, it, I, I think about the thumbprint and your way of taking your ear and the, the repetition of trying to find the right or not right, there is no right, but just your, the different angles, the, the different chemical processes that there's an, a, a unique imprint each time. Whereas we can literally hold down the button and shoot off 10 if we wanted to. Well, I mean, that's the, that's the part of photographic history we forget is that photo, it was more aligned with painting is it used to be a one of a kind object. Yes. It wasn't like something happened as reproducibility shifted um, sort of the understanding of the photographic process. And now reproducibility, that's not even a question, you know, uh, screens is not even a question, um, but it does change the impactfulness, but it also removes authorship in, or the importance of authorship in a lot of ways. It does remove, you know, it doesn't matter who's sitting on the backside of that camera. I think, I think, I mean, that's another thing on both sides of my white friends and, and character recognition is in my white friends, you have to, I'm sorry, my hands are close to the screen, but you have to recognize that a black person, nobody's, white people don't say my white friend, you know, that is a positioning of otherness as authorship. Um, and so there's, you know, there's other things happening there. Um, I was gonna say something else and I forgot. So I'm not gonna say it. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. I will tell you what also um, looking at your work today, what it also signaled to me anew is, you know, so many people were taken aback or pleasantly surprised by um, how beautiful Moonlight was shot, the movie Moonlight. And, um, and he referred it to it as an oil and sheen movie. <laughs> um, and I never heard that. <laughs> what's that? I didn't hear that. I've never heard that before about the movie. Yeah, That's well, good. Well, his point was, this is um, Barry Jenkins. His point was that typically on movie sets, makeup artists, especially with black folk, um, put powder, powder right. down to kind of neutralize the, the, their skin so that they don't have that glow up, right? That <laughs> literal glow up on their skin. Whereas for Jenkins, he made sure that the actors were constantly covered in jojoba and shea butter and any way that he could get their faces to glow because also being in Miami and it's hot and you're sweating to make that as realistic as possible. Right. And there's something about I know I'm going back to shine. Uh, no, but let me I'll, I'll, let me just say that it's interesting because I think uh, this is not about this about my work, but teaching photography at Spelman College, and if you don't know, uh, historical black college, all female. You know, I came down here to sort of start this photo program, and I teach a lighting class, which is just, is funny, and it's and for those who know me, and but they all want they all want the insecure, the cross light and glow. They mm -hmm. all want the moonlight. They all aspire to and, and think about how much that visual language has changed for black bodies in the last five or 10 years, essentially as they grow up and they don't understand why it wasn't like that before. Like, why wasn't Moesha shot like that? Which is just like, someone literally said that to me. And I was like, you're funny. Um, so, um, but I think that that is, I think that is a reckoning of having new, um, new representations in these fields of, of, of creatives, right? Um, but their desire is really this, you know, I think the insecure, uh, club scenes are like the best example where it's like cross lit and they're still shining um, with like a nice backlit. You know, they, they, they've got it. They know exactly what they want. I was like, okay, well, let's start with ratios <laughs> or how to plug this in, you know? Uh, but it, there is a desire. I think culture, 
again, this is visual culture creating a new path mm. or, or, or reflecting a new path for, for us to see beauty and grace in different ways. I mean, yeah, Moonlight, there's a couple of things these days that are just like, ooh, that is good. And, and it's not, it's not just- old version. Yeah. It's not in black and white. Yeah. Not virgin, V-R-G-I-N, but <laughs> um, blank, Rada Blank's new yeah. movie on Netflix, right? The, that there's something about capturing skin tone. I haven't seen that yet. I haven't seen that. That's on my, I'm going to put that on my list. because it It's beautifully shot and yeah. she got a lot of pushback about doing it in black and white. Hmm. They thought, you know, you really, you should, no. And yeah. she stuck to her vision. I think it was really effective hmm. and it's really funny. Um, I, okay, so I, I am also, I've spent a lot of time thinking about indexicality. Ooh, I didn't see that one. Okay. <laughs> okay I, <laughs> I was like, whoa, that's a big word. Okay, straight okay. on, ready. Yeah, I won't make it too heady, um, but the, you know, it's, it's a term, it's, has also been used quite a bit in photography and sort of that mark that's left behind. And um, the fingerprints in the corner, um, that, I, if you don't mind putting back up your slides. Sure. The- Oh, wait, hold on a second. Keep going, you keep talking, I gotta pour. Especially that, well, I love, I love this, the fingerprints that, that just, I'm the person who, when I'm looking at a painting, I, I literally will go to the edge. I want to see the edge of the canvas because I find that to be the most interesting part. Um, but I think it's slide 16. <laughs> wow. <laughs> to be exact. It's not, it's not 16, but oh, I, can pull, um, I can pull something. I can just pull that or so let's just do that. Keep going. Well, there's a couple. So I actually want to do the one that has the, your face completely, um, your eye is uh, six, yeah, 16. This one, but that's not an amber type. Oh, okay. So <laughs> which one is, which, well, give me, give me, oh, seven, seven. Seven. Okay. Sorry. This is taking me a moment because I've forgotten how my computer works. There we go. Can you see that or no? Yes. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. It's, um, it's just, if you told me this was, I mean, I know it's a photograph. <laughs> I know it's a photograph. Well, okay, let's also understand, just because I think scale matters. Yeah, and and I and I think seeing this on your screen, I mean, it's it's a beautiful reproduction. I'm really happy with it. It it reads a little bit different when it is handheld, when the lips are about the size of your face. They're not. It's not one to one, but it's pretty close. Okay. So there, I think I I get romance by seeing these on big screens, mm -hmm. um, but they but they do sit as an object a little bit differently than. Yeah. Okay. I just have to give it realistic pause. <laughs> right. Well, so getting back to this, this idea of, of the in index and Charles Peirce and the semiotics of the index and Roland Barthes and uh, Roland Barthes and them. Um, <laughs> you take that, me back to grad school. Yes, sure. <laughs> that fingerprint in the corner, the upper right corner, and then these sort of small, in the, in the bottom right corner where you get, it almost looks like a crack is happening, right? And these little, and along that, that left side yes. where it, it's, I'm without words, Myra, but <laughs> um, because I've constantly, I've constantly thought about this in terms of black folk and that you make so palpable the ability for black people, black women in particular, to be, it feels trite to say to be seen, 
mm-hmm. but to be felt that kind of phenomenological way of I see it, I want to feel it. You show the glass, I want to smell the chemicals, right? I want to <laughs> well, I want to have the the full multisensorial experience of that kind of index. Like you mentioned, you know, the all these photographers died because they were inhaling these invisible indexes of the <laughs> Right. I can say the um, you. I didn't really talk through the process very well, but you coat them on top with uh, this tree syrup or tree bark stuff, but you mix it with oil of lavender. So when you store them all together, you actually can open a box and it's just like oil of lavender. Oh my god! And so sometimes they still, some of them still sort of emote, and it's just. I, yeah, they, they do have that feeling. They don't forever, or I don't think they will forever, but they do for a period of time really do smell like lavender. They're really low. Okay. This is just, you know, a suggestion. <laughs> I'm, I'm not curating a show for you yet. And I can, may I please suggest that you provide an olfactory experience? No. <laughs> well, A, you know, you can't, the smell of collodion and ether is explosive. Oh. So. Well, well, the <laughs> lavender. And the, <laughs> there, there are ways to do this in a faux exercise. Okay. In a faux way. Yeah, I think that I would highly. I guess it's. Um, I guess it's it's funny to me because you're in the romantic stage of this, opposed to like the practical making stage of this, which right. is uh, highly yeah. laborious, uh, just a pain in the neck, like. Right. I didn't talk about how many plates get broken, how many things get ruined halfway through. You know, when you put that tree bark sap on it, you have to do that coating. I'm doing, making this motion. You heat that up over an open flame and have to keep it moving. If not, it sets on fire. And then you're holding a piece of glass on fire. So, and believe me, I've held many pieces of glass on fire in my own house and I'm like, how do I put this out and not take the whole fire? <laughs> Which I've successfully done. Um, but I think there's a romanticism to what you're thinking about. And then I'm still just thinking of like the practical, uh, don't set things on fire, don't, you know. Well, that's, I, I think that is the magic. That's where the magic of photography lands. Yeah. You do, you do right, we don't see the labor. No. <laughs> I, Nikki, oh, I think a lot of work, which is all labor. I think that's why the index is so po- important is hmm. that you're giving us a hint of the process or many, many hints of that fingerprint hmm. of where you can, you can actually visualize the sort of shifting nature of the, of the liquid surface. Maybe not the fire in your house. <laughs> But nobody wants it really and i i am i'm grateful that you've shown this to me and um shown this to, to me uh, all of <laughs> us are uh, people listening to us which is hysterical. i mean but that's i guess that's what i mean it's just I, I think in looking at your work there's something because it's so deeply personal and it's a reflection of who you are that you've given us a gift in sharing the surface of, of, of you and the labor with which you've done that work. So with that, I will say thank you and we will open it up for questions. Well, thank you, Nikki. I appreciate your, um, your kind, kind words. I appreciate that. How are we doing the question? Oh, Carrie's back. <laughs> <I'm> back. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> I will reiterate my thanks, Nikki. That was a wonderful conversation. And uh, yeah, before I get to the q and I'll just add that there is virtual applause coming in through the chat and the Q&A. Um, so certainly you have given us a gift tonight, Myra. Thank you. Oh, thank um, you and I'll start with a question that is actually related to what you were both just talking about in terms of labor. Uh, This is a question from one of our students at Wellesley College and a curatorial research assistant at the Davis, Dina. She asks, do you think the laborious process 
that you put into taking the photos, or we might say making the photos, also adds to the meaning of Black people's perception in American society? Good question, Dina. I don't, I don't know. So um, if, if you continue, I, I've done a back end of my life, but if you keep going into the front end of things that I make now, I tend to just make laborious objects um, by myself. I don't know why I keep doing it. Um, maybe that's how I get out of the house. Uh, but um, I don't know. I think that labor speaks more to who I am as an artist and kind of my artistic belief. I believe that, and I don't think I'm always right, that every artist should hand make, like be a part of every part of that process. I don't know if that's, in, I don't think that's intertwined with blackness. I think that's intertwined um, just with the, the, the aesthetics I have about photography. Mm -hmm. I know some, I, you know, I, I taught at, UN, or I went to grad school at UNM and we had a print room and the worst prints in the world were made by Robert Frank, right? They were just like dusty and grunt. You're like, what? I've seen a Robert, Fr I've seen the America's book. This book has beautiful prints in it. The real things were just kind of disastrous. Um, but I also know artists who like Bob Thal, an amazing craftsman. And I, I do believe in that, that hands-on skill and, and presenting that object like, yeah, the reason why I do this is because many cannot. So I don't know if that's connected with blackness, but I think it's just sort of my aesthetic of making. Thank you. Um, next, we have a question from Jordan Mayfield. Uh, it's quite long, so I'm going to read it slowly. Um, they say, hello, uh, Myra and Professor Green. I have a question musing about Myra's amber types and the possible connections to Tiffany Lothabo King's ideas on the perceived fungibility and porosity of enslaved peoples from her book, The Black Shoals. Is there something to be said about the photograph as a porous object due to the exposure to light required to make these images, but also due to their ability to hold on to these legacies and embodied histories of enslaved peoples? The various textures of these prints also suggest something that can be excavated underneath the surface. I'm reading this question in the chat as we've done this. I have not read Tiffany King's book. Neither, not yet. I have it. I haven't read it. I don't have it. I'm now. I'm like I'm so behind in my art history reading. It's it's deplorable. Um, I think there's. I think that's interesting. I do believe that photographs hold hold histories and multiple histories. Right. Um, sort of thinking about that uh, J.T. Seeley image. There's um, the photographer, there's the sitter, it's it, who, who, um, what's the word, commissioned the, the project itself, Agassi. Um, so there are multiple histories that I do, um, that do lend themselves to, to be, to be held by the, by the image. I think, um, it's, it's, you said print and I just have to say plates because it's an, ob I keep going back to like, it is really an object. Um, it's not a piece of paper. Um, and, and so that also, I mean, not, not to say that that doesn't mean it can't hold memory. It absolutely can. Um, so I think there's a possibility, but I, I feel like I can't fully answer the question because I don't fully know the argument. Mm. I apologize. I, I wanted to, it, it, this artist has been on the back of my mind and I, I, I'm hoping she's still here, but uh, Kara Salmon um, has a series, she's done many series of photographs, but she has a series of photographs on the architecture of slavery. And um, I just, she literally hand delivered um, her, her gallery um, catalog that's up in Chicago, um, San Francisco. And it's the same kind of thing that where you, that the, the porosity of the image and what it can hold depending on who, who, the, who the maker is and how it can give you new information 
depending on whether it's one's own body, if it's an architectural space, and, and the process itself provides the new meaning that, that um, is intended. So again, I, I, I'm really still taken aback by your, your comment that first, in that first sitting of, oh my God, I look like a slave. Like what, what's happening here? I, I, don't, I, I don't know how many times that happens to people. <laughs> it doesn't happen very many times. I don't know what's happening to you, Virginia. <laughs> um, so thank you, Jordan. Jordan Mayfield is a Wellesley alum as well. And um, we both are. We both share Jordan. So. <laughs> Jordan's been in both of our classrooms. Yes. Um, okay, the next question is from Kim Joseph, who is um, asking about my white friends. They say, the conversation about my white friends reminds me of the phenomenon of art created by Black people being automatically linked to slavery, racism, or racial identity, regardless of the artist's intention. How has that impacted public perception of your art? Does it make you feel empowered, stifled? And if you had taken these photos without the intent to connect it to racial issues, do you think the percep perception of Black art as inherently racial would have still given them that meaning? I'm, I'm, I pull this, again, I'm reading and pulling it up because I want to make sure I don't make any assumptions. So I will start by saying, Kim, when I started this project, these are truly my white friends. These are people I've worked with, known since grade school, through grad school, through basically till the project started. And I literally said to them, can I photograph you? And they said, why? And I said, because you're white. It's, it, 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 the, the racial premise was on the table from the get. And, uh, and it was a part of the project. I think my question about, or where I'm getting confused is like the perception of black art is inherently racial. I don't, I'm an artist who is black. I don't know what black art means. And so I think, and that is potentially a big, huge, that's a symposium question as to um, unpacking uh, perhaps how artists describe themselves opposed to how communities describe them or, or, or locates uh, communities of people. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I, am, I am an artist who's black who makes issues now around literally the premise of color uh, and the implications of that metaphor. So I, that's where I was like, let me read this again. So yes, the work was intended to be racial, just the same way that character recognition was meant to be racial. Um, I don't know if I'm empowered or stifled or it's, it's sort of, I am driven by conceptual conceits or conceptual questions and, and they guide me through that, that conversation in my head guides me through a process of making. Um, and, I, and, and in some ways that conversation just isn't, it's not empowering like over other people. It's empowering that the conversation is happening in my head or the nuances are coming out as thoughts or they're coming out as objects or I can figure out a way to articulate a metaphor through an object. Is it always, is that metaphor always read in the object? No totally understand that. But um, that's where, uh, I, that's how I would say there's an emotion, that's the emotional impact that it has. I hope that answers. I think it does. And maybe a related question. Um, and that also ties back to Nikki's point about when you started this, who are you making them for is um, from Maggie Adler, who asks, how do you feel about white or institutional ownership of these objects? There is a lot of institutional and white ownership of these objects. Uh, and I, I see it both ways. I see that, you know, I, I would say that the, the most prominent one, and I, I truly appreciate it, is the National Gallery of Art owns, I want to say 12 of them, maybe more. Um, and people are like, how could you do it? And I say, well, now I'm a part of American art history until the end of time. And so I think people, the institutionalism seems like this big word that um, separates haves and haves nots or the New York Public Library owns a couple of pieces. Well, that means to me that then this work will live on past me. 
and can be shared in a multitude of conversations around a lot of different things. Like I'm sure um, I'm a part of this conversation because of process, right? I could be a part of another conversation because of women or because of history or, and, and institutional ownership allows for that to happen and allows them to create and craft interesting stories. So, so institution and, and also financially supports me to do the next project, <laughs> um, which is always what we're looking for. Um, so there's, so I, I understand that, um, I would say that Fern Shad is an amazing collector, um, part of, again, specific photo history. And she um, really has been a champion of my work. And I appreciate to be a part of her collection because it is world renowned. Um, and, and, and being a part of these collections also moves you into other institutions as, as they are gifted um, to people. That is how I got into the Studio Museum. Um, so, so yeah, I hope that answers. Nikki's off mic, so I'm gonna let her talk. Well, I was also gonna just, my only addition is your own, your own words, that your work becomes part of the visual triggers of photographic history, that you're doing that for others that as a part of these collections, you do the same work that's come before you. Thank you. <laughs> Regardless of race or gender. Right, right. Um, the next question is from C. Rose Smith, who is curious if you can talk more about the gaze. They write, uh, I'm curious to know if you as an African-American woman find that returning is specific to the lens attached to the camera body or the medium altogether, including its historic processes. I'm not sure I quite follow, but the gaze. <laughs> I, I I don't know if I quite follow either, but I think um, it, it's it, so. <laughs> I'm trying to like say this in in a non too heady art history way. I think. Photography, um, generally, historically, is a history of a lot of white men making pictures. And therefore, the gaze is not often questioned. I think that's like the natural inherent underpinning of art, even commercial photographic history. And so, in some ways, I can never say is my gaze different than a white male's. I mean, I know inherently it is, but I still lust for things. I still, you know, am, am disgusted by things. And does that change the way I um, organize a frame? Yes. But I think how Nikki talked about Moonlight and, and, and Barry Jenkins and Issa Rae and, and sort of thinking about that Oh, that can answer my question. Okay, I can, I, I can answer my question in the back end way. So in thinking about that visual culture, I think what, um, there's a really good video and now I can't remember the name of it, but it really discusses how um, color film was invented to photograph white people and ignored black people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and looks at how, why Kodak did that um, looks at how they, when Oprah came about, it's like a four minute video, I showed it to all my students. When Oprah came, when the Cosby show came, they actually realized that they had to learn how to change the technology to record black skin. So that was like a manufactured technical change of the gaze. Hmm. Um, so I think, yes, the gaze is specific and how it bears out in each medium um, becomes really interesting. I can say, embarrassingly with my white friends, like I hadn't photographed a lot of white people before I'd done that project. So I had to shift like, how does this camera function with a white body in front of it? Oh, differently than a black body in front of it. People don't realize that that actually has to occur on both sides of when white folks have to learn how to photograph black folks, but it also happens the opposite way as well. When you're like, oh, that refracts a lot more light than I'm used to. Let's <laughs> turn that down a little. Um, so yeah, there's there's that as well. I don't think I answered that question, but I rambled very well. I think I did that. Oh, it's fascinating. <laughs> um, the next question is from Dana Gee uh, from the Photographic Historical Society of New England. Um, and I'm gonna 
briefly summarize, I think, uh, because it's a, another long question, I think she's asking about your choice of um, presentation and not framing the amber types of the collodion uh, plates as they would have been in the 19th century. Could you speak to that a little bit? Sure. So um, there have been a lot of iterations of the framing over the years. And I think actually as they've gone into institutions, people want them more locked down than I would present them. Uh, originally, they were just sort of on, I don't have any, they're in my basement, uh, plexi shelves. And they would just sort of lean on a plexi shelf on a wall. And you could sort of really see the object. But people were like, someone's going to steal that off the wall. Um, and then uh, they were presented that way, but then put in a vitrine or in a glass box. I really like that ability because I, I don't think we think of photographs as objects often. And so when you see an open piece of glass, you really are confronted that that's an object, not, you can say that's an image on glass, but that should lead you to saying that's an object. So over the years, some we've with my gallery developed a way to frame them so they still are open edged, but they are still secure in a frame. So they're open edged, matted, but then open faced as well. So um, yeah, I do try to. Um, I don't really like frames. I, I like <laughs> I like touching paintings at museums. <laughs> so <laughs> don't let me in the Davis. Uh, so. Um, <laughs> So I think that I try to present the work as open as possible, knowing that that upsets curators, conservators, uh, and many others. No, that, the object hook strikes me as so important for your work and you are welcome at the Davis anytime. <laughs> and, and um, there's an interesting play on, on the light coming through them the way that you had them installed, at least in the image that you showed us. So you yeah, the new work, and I think that's really important for the new work because it. we started with putting, that's a whole other story, but when you have a piece of colored glass, the first inclination was literally just to put it, it looks different on white with white underneath it versus black underneath it. And so that's a whole long, you know, metaphor, conceptual path that is a very deep dive, but um, you know, like situ and, and it's, well, that whole work is about situational color theory um, and, and my blackness being situational. I'm a very different black person in very different situations. Mm -hmm. um, and that that's sort of an underpinning for the, that show. Um, I totally forgot what I was talking about. Oh, but, but seeing that light come through is a totally different installative um, reckoning, right, about again, making them feel more object-based. I'm going to squeeze in one more question, okay. <laughs> even though we're at the end of our time. Um, so it's a really good one, and it comes from Jessica Burko, the PRC, um, who asks if you're still doing this type of self-portraiture, and if so, how it has been impacted by the current climate in the country. Mm. So I stopped, the last time I made this work was 1718. Uh, it was, um, I sort of finished it around March in 2018. Um, and I've moved on to other work. And so right now I'm, <laughs> make, this will make very little sense and it's a totally different lecture, but I'm working on textiles, um, fabric dyeing and silk screening um, and quilts like work. I'll send you a link, Nikki. Next week, I got another talk. <laughs> uh, so it's a totally different process. I am, I say I'm not a person who works in the moment. I think the reference to Katrina wasn't like, oh, this is about the hurricane. It's like this like fifth tiered story um, mm -hmm. about the ramifications of Katrina. Um, this moment, I mean, can we get, I don't, I can't make work about this moment because I'm just trying to get through it. Uh, <laughs> and, and I'm making the work, the work I'm making right now, I truly love. Um, it is again laborious, but I, I, and it does then also sit within this beauty to then create really complicated questions about self and color and interaction. So I'm happy with where my work is right now because 
we'll come out the other side, all of us, and then we can meditate together and, and figure out what did we learn. I don't know what that is yet. And I'll just say that I think it is so important for this moment. Um, it, it's helping us to get through it, your work, Myra. So huh. thank you. Thank, um, you. thank you for sharing your presentation and your work with us this evening. It is, um, as you all discussed, it is equal parts beautiful and conceptually challenging and so, so important. Um, and thank you, Nikki, for your insightful comments and for helping us to think through the, uh, the process and the aesthetic of shine in Myra's work. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees for joining us this evening. The Handmade Photography Today Virtual Artist Talk series will continue on December 10th with a presentation by Will Wilson. So we hope that you all will be able to join us then. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Myra. Thank you, Nikki. <laughs>